Hi folks, my name is Ian Piepenbrock. I am the founder and creative director of Gobsmacked, the agency that exists to unlock the hidden potential of your brand in a video-driven world. Now, if you want to turn your brand into a video-first powerhouse through each stage of your customer journey, we can help you with that. Just shoot us a message and we'd be happy to talk about it. Today, I have a guest in this podcast and his name is Dion Pau. He's the founder and CEO of 3DWD, a creative services agency that exists to activate vacant storefronts and enhance overall customer experience, experiences and many things more. Uh, we will talk about a lot of things. If you like this video, please click the like button and also subscribe to our channel because there is much more to come. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Dion. Welcome to our podcast. How are you today? Good morning, Ian. I'm doing well. Thank you. And you are calling in from Lisbon or close to Lisbon, Portugal? Yes, yes. I'm, uh, I'm based in Lisbon uh, since three years now. And uh, it's uh, uh, a bit different. I mean, uh, we, where we met, uh, we were both living in the Netherlands. And uh, since, um, since then, some things have changed. But um, uh, yeah, it's going well. Going well, thank you. Change for the better, I would say. Uh, because, yeah, we met in uh, the beautiful village, Dutch village called Gorkum. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, well, I have to watch my words. Huh? It's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty town, it's very nice. Uh, the, um, the weather wise, things have improved. Uh, uh, and it's, um, it's also always nice to you know, be triggered by the changes and uh, different lifestyle uh, and, and also different cultures. I think it helps to trigger creativity as well so it's in that sense we're happy to have a change of scenery fully agree uh, you know being abroad or working for periods uh, abroad uh, experiencing other things uh, other ways of working and doing is it's really inspiring it's really cool it's good for for everyone i would recommend it uh, and I'm a, I'm a bit envious because you have been there for years now three years three years, three years. yeah yeah it's great a bit climate very- I, I had been, I've of course lived abroad uh, in the past, uh, I think uh, nine years in total, so in different countries. Uh, but uh, ever since founding 3DWD, I was in the Netherlands and uh, I actually thought I was going to stay in the Netherlands uh, forever until um, uh, because of the developments with the company, we wanted to do more things internationally and we were looking at uh, a, a new office uh, in, in somewhere bit sunnier uh, uh, so we looked at the various options and eventually we we decided for uh, for Lisbon and uh, even though it was planned to be only for three to six months it's uh, turned out to be a bit longer than that <laughs> uh, yes d- definitely and uh, yeah for good reasons I suppose because I know that uh, your company 3DWD has always been very internationally orientated so did that also play a role in you know relocating to uh, Lisbon Yes, yes. So uh, what we're seeing is that um, we have a niche type of solution. Um, it can potentially work anywhere in the world, but it's really related to shopping centers. And uh, although we have shopping centers in the Netherlands and we also have high street shops, um, it's not the country in the world you think of when you think about shopping centers. And um, because of that reason, early on, we started uh, looking over the borders. And uh, I think. Uh, Within the first year of existence, we already had projects in five countries. Um, I think in the second year we uh, we existed, we uh, started a company also in the United States, and uh, since then we've we now work in forty to fifty countries uh, per year. Um, wow! And the um, the reason why we were looking for a new office was primarily because we were looking to attract international talent, people with certain language skills, cultural backgrounds to be able to connect with clients in their own language and to also understand some of the cultural um, significance uh, differences uh, in order to be able to deliver the best possible possible service. So uh, that's the reason we went to a city uh, where there's a a big international crowd. So not per se only to find Portuguese um, uh, colleagues, uh, we do have Portuguese colleagues, which is great, but we'll, it's really to tra- tap into a bigger international crowd of people. Understood. And 
Uh, so uh, sourcing talent, talent is the main reason. Of course, the climate, as you already mentioned. Yes. No, not, not, not really. So let's have a look back uh, on the journey uh, that led you to this, to this point. Because how did this all start out? How did you come up with the idea uh, of uh, doing something with vacant storefronts and turning them into some sort of customer experience? Yes. So in, in 2011, um, well, actually, I've got back a, a bit. In 2008, I started my family uh, family's business, which has been in uh, retail signage uh, and, and graphics uh, for 50 years. And I joined that business and uh, was looking to find ways to, to grow it and to make it uh, more innovative. innovative. And uh, by chance, at some point, I was reading uh, an article in the newspaper where it was written that in 2011, because of the, the results also of the financial crisis, yep. um, there was close to 14, 14.5% of vacancy in Dutch uh, high streets and also in shopping centers. And that same day I had a barbecue with a friend and uh, I had the idea, wouldn't it be cool instead of showing uh, for lease in the traditional way where you have like a broker sign uh, to call and but then you look into a vacant unit um, wouldn't it be cool to show the potential of that space? So if you use 3D design to show, for example, a, uh, a famous coffee chain or a, um, a shoe store or whatever we find relevant for that spot. So I spoke with my friend who was a 3D designer and said, could you, is that technically possible? Because I'm not a 3D designer. So uh, said, yes, we can. So we desi he designed something which um, uh, we then installed on a storefront. We wrote a press release about it. And this got picked up in the media, primarily in the Dutch media, but uh, in print, but also TV, and later also in other countries. And from there, um, what started as a joke, uh, as something that we were just testing, turned into uh, a company. Uh, and also what we've learned, and it's, a lot has changed in the industry since, but in 2011, we found that um, a lot of the thinking was that the only client is our tenant, which is of course true, uh, but um, uh, the final customer is, of course, the, the shopper. And uh, this in 2021 is very different. And uh, a lot of these mall developers have really changed the way they, uh, they manage this and how they develop new concepts for that. But back in 2011, I felt that it wasn't like that. So the 3DWD business is primarily uh, how we started to activate vacancies. But um, we've added a lot of different services, with, all with the objective to improve the customer experience and to create some unicity to individual properties um, around the world. Yeah, oh, very, very clear explanation, I, I would say. Uh, one of the things that always appealed to me uh, more from a philo philosophical point of view about uh, the things that you do with the company is that when you see vacant storefronts and you see a lot of them, you, I always get the feeling of, a, you know, something, a, a regressive situation or a uh, an ominous feeling because it's empty and that is always a sign of things gone bad or things gone, uh, you know, backwards. And uh, I mean, by applying, by designing and applying those 3D uh, designs over the full size of the, of, the, of the storefront, you turn it into a happy experience. Uh, so basically uh, a street that, 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 is, that is just, you know, cardboard covered or, you know, covered up with boards is now an inspiring uh, uh, visual. And uh, I mean, it's a, that's a really cool way to look at it. And it started as a joke, you said, but it's actually, when you think of it, it's, it's very, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And then the yeah, second well, point. What we say is that there, there are several ways and several consumers for this. Uh, so. Uh, and also several reasons why you do it. The, mm -hmm. the first one is, uh, and that's mostly when it relates to uh, a new property that opens, uh, it's about disguising vacancy. So it, it, if people yeah. come to a property for the first time, uh, sure, you can put some branding if you have one or two vacancies, but if you have more than that, then at some point, uh, those types of images scream vacancy. So what some of the compliments exactly. we've had with our first um, mall opening projects were that we actually, it didn't feel like there was that much vacancy, even though in some cases there was. Yep. Um, another thing is to use it um, to create an, uh, an experiential moment. So uh, we moved away over the years from just the 3D, which we still do, uh, to, to show the potential of a vacancy, to, uh, where our consumer is basically a potential tenant or uh, the, 
the existing tenant that doesn't want to look at a vacancy. Uh, we move to uh, more interactive type of concepts where it's yes. about creating a, an Instagrammable moment or where you want to have an educational moment or something specifically for children. Um, so that is more uh, interactive in that sense. And now uh, recently we've also started with something new where we we integrate um, brand experiences uh, into the mix because what we're seeing uh, is that yes there are some difficulties in in retail real estate around the world uh, some of them can be attributed to COVID-19 some of them to um, you know more structural changes in consumer behavior and the rise of the uh, of the internet uh, all of these things have been discussed by many people and uh, but I do believe that there's still a, a very int a big interest, a very large interest for retailers to open up shops um, because offline retail will always be there. Maybe mm -hmm. not in the way that we are used to, but there will always be physical shops. And then the second thing is that a lot of the brands, digital native brands that have started online um, are starting to see that the perceived low cost of acquiring customers online are not as low. Uh, as initially thought. So there is an increasing appetite to test uh, offline types of retail. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, cre be creative and be flexible about how that can be done. And we call that concept uh, Forefront. And it's basically, it's an interactive uh, storefront with um, actual products uh, where people can engage with the brand, touch, feel, even purchase uh, and we use technology to measure uh, the engagement so basically we would provide similar data to what you would get if you ran a Facebook or a Google AdWords campaign but we're doing that from a physical standpoint and that now yeah, that's great to tap into um, the huge amounts of traffic of people that just walk by that every day uh, and, and, and I think it's we've seen some nice uh, wow effects with some of our clients because um, uh, it's underestimated by traditional uh, uh, or traditional uh, by digital native brands because uh, the mindset is completely the opposite and I think in general um, too much of the discussion is about one week somebody writes a piece about uh, the malls are dying and then the next week somebody's saying uh, online doesn't work and the truth is as always somewhere in the middle I think absolutely it, mm. yeah and that fits in with what you do as well the, the, the branding part um, the, the being consistent in your storytelling and, and having a good product, it doesn't really matter if that's online or offline. You just need to look at, is this location, whether it's through an online channel or through an offline channel, is that speaking to and is it connecting with my clients? And, yep. and, and, and then there's a room for both. Absolutely. I, I, and I know this has been your vision for quite a long time because actually when we met, it was back in 2016, I, I believe, uh, you are already trying to uh, to integrate uh, a brand activation, offline brand activation in certain projects that you have been doing. I, I'm sure this has progressed and things have become more sophisticated and, you know, different ways and shapes and forms. But I remember we, we, we worked uh, for you on a project uh, in Vancouver that you were you guys were doing, the Twasson Mill Shopping Center. And uh, already there you saw multiple uh, examples of uh, brand activation that they were trying to implement in, in certain uh, storefronts. Not just brand activation, but also services uh, by integrating visual content and video content in the storefronts. Um, uh, I, I think there was some kind of virtual uh, cloth, clothes uh, fitting uh, experience as well. Yes. And, and a couple of those instances, and this was back in 2016, of course, Five years later, the world has changed rapidly, but still, I, I know that you always have been pushing for that. And that is, of course, very appealing to us as an agency working for brands, uh, making the, the connection uh, with uh, offline activation and basically, you know, pulling potential customers and fans into a funnel through an offline location. It's really interesting. And yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's true. And uh, the, the nice thing is that uh, uh, since then, some of the positive outcomes of COVID uh, are that uh, technology has improved uh, and all, but even more important because techno technology has been there for a while, but uh, customer uh, uh, adoption has improved. So 
the QR code, to name a simple thing, uh, which was never used previously, is now everybody uses it. My, my grandma. Yeah, it was always the ugly duck of, of digital marketing. Exactly. And I still believe, I mean, a QR code by itself is nothing. Uh, but exactly. it, it's about what you, how you uh, announce it and, how, and what type of value is behind it. Exactly. But yeah. um, even that, even, I mean, I used to say, <laughs> just scan every QR code you see if you can win a prize with it because you'll win because nobody did it. Uh, and that has changed, um, uh, but it's also, you know, the, 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 the virtual fitting room concept that you, you mentioned uh, back then yeah. was very hard to actually make, an, it, it was a gimmick back then. So it, it worked, it looked nice on you and you could take a selfie with it and you could leave your data and, uh, you, so that you could uh, order it. But then, actually, you didn't. You wouldn't have a, an actual size. You know, it would be very tough to do that. Uh, right now, there is plenty of technology. Yeah, instead, you would get like ten newsletters every week that you didn't exactly. really ask for. Yeah, exactly. There, exactly. there was no real added value behind it for the customer yet. Correct. Correct. So the the um, but now that's possible. Now it's very easy to 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 make it uh, more tangible and really even you know have it shipped to you the next hour if you wanted to. Uh, so. Both from a logistics standpoint, uh, from a, a customer experience and technology standpoint, um, five years uh, are make a huge difference. And yeah. uh, right now, uh, we're able for many different brand segments to really um, serve as a, an enhanced type of showroom to validate the value of a brand and also uh, help customers to to get the information they need to, in order to buy the right thing for them. Uh, yeah, it, it's an acceleration, uh, as you mentioned, because, uh, I mean, I've been hearing talk of, you know, retail retail transitioning into more of experience centers instead of actual, uh, you know, retailers selling products on the spot. And uh, a situation like this, and it has been going on for multiple years, but definitely an acceleration during the COVID, I would say, uh, it's purely an experience uh moment yes uh, and uh, because yeah the COVID situation is very interesting how do you think how obviously it impacted retail because in a lot of countries uh unfortunately they had to close down they had to, to close their business at least temporary yes. so obviously that is a, that is an impact but how would you say it would impact retail f on the long term um it accelerates uh, so uh, a lot of the processes that were already going on, the, 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 there has been a, a, a move where um, if you categorize malls by ABC type of malls, that the C type of malls were not doing so great, especially in North America where um, um, these were placed remote. Uh, so uh, in the old model that worked great and not so much anymore. Uh, a fun thing is that uh, some of the properties that you think wouldn't do so well uh, actually did great. So a lot of uh, um, out of uh, outdoor centers uh, with you know a big uh, grocery store, uh, they did great, uh, and and everybody next to it was profiting. Uh, and then of course there you see the, the 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 entrepreneurial behavior of retailers and also landlords in facilitating a curbside pickup uh, or exactly. uh, delivery. Yeah. So a lot of things were done. I'm afraid that even though it's very entrepreneurial, in many cases, it's not a very profitable business case. So it's really to just stay busy and improve your concept so that when things do improve, you yeah. added some value in the chain. It's damage surviving, basically. It's damage control. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, but that has happened. I think so. Um, what it has done is you see a lot of new concepts coming to life and a lot of concepts yeah. that therefore start online. Uh, who will also see that um, at some point uh, they'll have to move offline. And you see that. There's a huge wave of digital native brands opening stores, uh, pop-up stores. We see it with Forefront that there's an, an interest in, in doing this in a more flexible and uh, economically interesting way without diminishing you know, the brand experience because that is, that is key. We should never go uh, down in that. So. Um, I think what you will see in the short term is that a lot of uh, the companies that are suffering are, are the smaller ones uh, who um, can't make uh, rent payments or uh, and will be snapped up by 
you know, the, the bigger uh, the bigger retailers and also the bigger yeah. funds. Um, that's, that's, a big always what happens. that's always what happens in a crisis. So, uh, True, it centralizes, right? There's a big, uh, huge amount of centralization going on. And I see it in my own environment, living environment as well. I mean, the small independent retailers, which I always very much respect because it's, it's, a, it's tough to, to, to stay afloat even without COVID. Yes. They, uh, they are really struggling. And yes, there will be a huge centralization. It will be mostly the big brands. Uh, guzzling uh, everything uh, down, and uh, but th- yes. yeah, that's a normal normal process in a recession. Yeah, I think so. Oh, well, what I think is interesting, uh, again going back to the forefront idea, is that as a consumer, uh, what you're looking to to have is, is to be surprised. You know, to that if you you go to a property and you go for the main drivers, the the anchors. That's why most people go. But it's nice if you then are surprised by a new brand. Um, traditionally, there was not much room for that. So traditionally, you would have, you know, 10-year leases uh, and it's the same brand. So if, if it's fully let, then that's what you have for the next 10 years. Uh, there's been changes where, you know, there's more specialty leasing happening, where you'd have kiosks and uh, different types of activations. Um, but still, it's limited because it's a specific type of brand. Um, it depends a little bit on the operator and also a bit on, the, on, on how far a landlord is uh, engaged with that, but um, um, not always as interesting. Some are, some are not. Um, mm-hmm. What I think is interesting now is if you can create a way for brands that are very niche, very specific, to to go in and try uh, on a you know a three month basis. Uh, as a consumer, if you would have you know five or six spots which are always changing, uh, that adds value to, for me as a consumer. It adds value for the whole property because you you provide a sense of um, anticipation that something will be different next time I'm coming in. Uh, And I think uh, in order for that whole thing to work, and uh, you need to be flexible and it shouldn't be too expensive. Otherwise, it's hard to maintain that. And uh, eventually the idea is that these concepts will see how well they do and they will want to move into a more permanent space, of course. Yes, yeah, I, I can see that happening. So, uh, what is the role in? Uh, w- because if you want to keep the cost, uh, you know, if you want to keep it feasible, feasible, especially when you want to have repetitive uh, campaigns running and stuff like that, uh, I would say that also to keep it feasible, digital content is key, right? Because that's pretty easy to to, to produce instead of you know having all these physical uh, elements. Uh, Yes. Having to be cre- created, yeah. So, wh- do you see an uh, an influx of, uh, for example, video content or interactive content uh, in those in those storefronts or those forefront concepts that 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 are emerging? Uh, definitely, definitely. Because the way we see it is, rather than building out the whole space, we only build out twenty percent of it. Yeah. Uh, so we try to uh, take the essence of a brand and try to get the maximum engagement. We need to define what that maximum engagement is so that we can measure if there's a conversion. And that conversion can be a sale, it can be a test drive for specific type of brands. Um, whatever we define it is, maybe it's a sign up uh, to a subscription. Yeah. Uh, we try to capture that essence and for that we need you know, a brand story, which is usually, you, know, you need video content for that. You need um, a visual in, in, in print probably, uh, yep. You need some uh, touch display options to 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 understand what are the options. Uh, maybe some measuring if that's in place. Um, yeah. These can be staffed or unstaffed. It depends a little bit on the brand and also on their uh, willingness to uh, how far they want to take it. Uh, but um, yeah, definitely visual content plays an more a very important role. It's it's le- and that's a, also a long process. Where um, in the way business, the retail business goes now, you can you can buy anything anywhere. So the only value, the only way you can be different is if people really want it from you. Uh, so if and by in order to achieve that, uh, you need to explain why you are cool <laughs> and why why yeah. you are the one that is best uh, suited to deliver this in a way that adds value. Um, uh, it's not uh, to just put a collection of products there, uh, uh, products that you could also buy directly from that brand. So uh, for that sense, we think you don't need a full space to test. No, it's all about the brand experience. That's where it starts. The, the, that's the first touch point that you want to create. And then, uh, yeah, 
people want to buy your product if, if, if done right. Um, so what are some recent examples that you, well, no, first let, let me ask, of course, one of the great things is that you can measure interaction. You can measure the rate of activation, uh, how many conversion moments there are achieved with, with such a, with such a setup, such a concept. Um, so what in your experience are the things that people get a kick out of these days? Is it a, uh, is it a virtual experience? Is it a fitting experience? What are some of the examples that really, really worked well in this current oh, That's age? a good question. I mean, um, within the forefront, uh, uh, so far, a lot of it I, I can say is uh, what we notice between in the conversation with the brands, because uh, a lot of the preparation is going on because uh, of COVID, uh, uh, yeah. we're postponing some of the inst installations because we want to test in a full environment and we don't think we get the uh, a realistic picture if we launch in a mall that's partially closed. Yep. Um, what I feel though um, for the um, for the consumer is interesting is that a lot of these brands live online now, so people are used to a brand that they've seen going by on their Instagram feed, and it's a sense of excitement if you can see that brand in a physical environment. Then all of yeah. a sudden it becomes real. Yeah, and maybe also with some resemblance to how they communicate online. Correct. Sort of a, Correct. A, I, I can imagine a real life Instagram feed or something like that. Yes, yes, uh, that, that, that can be done. And uh, um, it, it, we sometimes, I mean, some one concept we're doing now is uh, there's a, a, a feeling that innovation means digital, which is not true. Uh, in the end, you need to look at what is the value you're offering. So take, for example, if you're an online brand and you sell uh, jeans, then one of the things in the process that you can improve, so one of them is um, telling that brand story, but they do a good job often doing that online. But what you can do online is touch. So that is something that needs to be done offline. Yep. Uh, and what you can do or what you could have some issue with is, is measuring. Now, there are very cool tools to do so digitally, uh, but sometimes for a specific brand, I mean, the setting you have behind you, um, if you make it into a tailor type of shop and you would have somebody just measuring that and you put it into the customer kit, then you got the value. You got the value, yeah. you actually know the, the sizes and that person can go order it online. Um, it doesn't need to be a digital tool, is, is what I'm saying. And uh, the, the, the value comes from understanding where are the gaps uh, between the online and the offline, and then using the offline to facilitate and fill in the blanks. Yep. And if your brand is very tech savvy and likes you know, these types of uh, wow type of experiences digitally, then great. But if, if you're actually selling authenticity, it doesn't need to be digital. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, this really taps into the full sensory experience that you want to offer. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I really like is the combination of digital and actual physical elements, whether it be humans or, uh, or, or other physical objects or, or experiences. And connecting that uh, as seamless as possible is, is a great thing to play with. And yes. uh, the, op the options will be getting more and more uh, sophisticated. Um, sure. I mean, VR, VR comes to mind as a very obvious one. Um, so yeah, the full sensory experience. I have a question about that actually, because in my last podcast, we talked to Francisco, he's our sound designer. And we talked about the role that, uh, well, the full sensory experience plays in, uh, in uh, purchasing behavior. Uh, obviously there is, uh, there is something visual, uh, but what is the role, uh, for sound and maybe even things like smell? Uh, how do you see that future? Do you think that will, because they, they've been doing this forever, right? Stores have been, have been, you know, spraying certain, certain smells to activate certain memories or uh, emotions. Yes. Is that something you experiment with as well? Sound and smell? Uh, yes, we definitely look at the, that because it's, uh, they're very powerful, uh, senses. Uh, I know that, uh, brands try to, uh, infuse them in, in, in store concepts as well. I mean. Uh, you know, uh, famous soap brands like uh, uh, Lush, who you can smell from the other side of the property. Uh, you know, uh, some uh, fashion brands uh, who play very loud music. Uh, uh, 
that's also where the, the some of the challenges come in especially if you're doing a, a, a temporary brand activation you need to you need to uh, be respectful to the tenants around you and to the the property so um, yeah. there's a limit to how much smell and sound you can uh, infuse but it definitely is part of the brandscape uh, it's definitely something that needs to be considered uh, because the nice thing is that they work more um, uh, subconscious uh, it, it's it's yes. smoother in the way uh, people do make a connection with it uh, and that's also again something that you can't do online so it's something where offline plays a very important role yeah interesting it seems like limitless possibilities but there's also a very fast moving uh, sector that you're operating in of course because of all the uncertainties uncertainties of course reasonably speaking i think uh, at some point we should be sort of back to some form of normal where you can have uh, uh, you know complete data sets of uh, the behavior of people walking through malls and uh, interacting with the storefronts yes but uh, yeah but but i think we're only at the beginning i mean we talked about an acceleration of the adoption of technology i mean the technology is already there same goes for virtual events for example yes that has accelerated uh, well, through the roof, and we, we have uh, experience with that as well. And it's all due to COVID. It's weird that first some sort of artificial, well, not artificial, but gap has to be created in order to have this uh, or accelerate this experience because the technology has been there for close to 10 years, I would say. Yes, and yeah, as well, it's the same with video conferencing. Uh, yeah. Just these video calls, I mean, is it really necessary? Uh, do, I can tell you, I mean, we, we work internationally, but the, I did not jump on a plane for every project we did. Yeah, um, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit disappointed that you didn't do it for this podcast, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's we're a bit not. disappointed. <laughs> no, but the, 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 uh, it, it's not, for us in this case, it was not uh, economically viable to do that. No. Uh, uh, but also for people where it might be uh, less of an economical problem, um, it makes no sense. So I, I, I do believe that uh, physical encounters are very important. I will always keep going to trade shows when I'm allowed to. Yeah. Um, uh, but to jump, I like the, 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 the logic in the past that uh, even if there's nothing important to discuss, that you would have to fly to London to have a meeting of 30 minutes and then fly back just because that's how we always done it, um, makes no sense. No, it's and, a waste of uh, waste of time and money for sure. Waste yeah, of time and money, but also waste of uh, you know uh, of uh, air uh, and of uh, fossil fuels, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it makes no sense. So um, yeah. yes, if you need to do so, uh, goes into the overall you know post COVID time. You see so many people um, living somewhere else uh, and, and still working uh, in the in, in the place where they used to work. Um, Again, I, 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 I strong believer that also the office market will go back to, you know, to a, for a large part, back to what it was, just mm -hmm. because that interactive interaction between people, also in a creative process, oh, uh, yes. all sorts of process, is very important. Uh, and I think a lot of people who in the past thought they would want to work from home always have kind of come back from that. Uh, yes, but more well, second, more flexible, yeah. Oh yes, more flexible and hopefully also the moments that you are meeting up physically will be more, you know, there will be higher, they will be higher quality moments. This is something, uh, something I hope because I'm a, I'm a big believer in human interaction, real life human interaction. And it also depends on your character. I'm someone who really feeds, feeds off that creative energy. Yes. I really need it. Uh, but sometimes there are, as you know, there are also meetings that are just very they're soul crushing uh, you know, too long. Uh, yeah, not, you skip. <laughs> yeah, you should just skip skip those meetings. So my hope is that uh, there will be some sense that the actual physical moments will be of higher quality. Uh, but this is just uh, just a, a hope I have. But I, I'm a big believer in human interaction. Uh, but uh, we'll see. It will be very interesting to see how this will all balance out and what will remain of the old ways and what will uh yeah re remain of those new ways that we are experiencing now uh i've never had so many video calls in my life honestly i say i mean it works but it's not ideal for me at some point uh at some point i just don't feel like it anymore but we have to um 
True. Yeah. I, I, I agree. But if, I think if you combine it and you take the best of both, yes. uh, um, uh, commercially, it's good because it allows you to, you know, you could do eight meetings in a day if you wanted to. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then you could spend two other days uh, going into depth and meeting people in person and then the rest of the week to, you know, work out on everything you're promising yeah. in your calls and meetings. Um, th that is... Um, that is a big upside. Uh, I agree. I mean, if, it's not fun to have eight meetings in a day, even though I like, I like what I do and I like speaking with people. So Me in that too, sense, yep. I enjoy it. Uh, and it's nice. What I do think is a big advantage in the past, uh, if I if I spoke to clients um, who were not from the Netherlands, then uh, there would be an expectance that it would be a, a phone call. And I think a video call has far more value than a phone call. I agree. In I that agree. sense, it's an improvement. Yeah, the barrier to jump on a video call has become much lower and that is good. Uh, so at least you can look people in the eye and you have some sort of, uh, you know, full interaction. Yes. Uh, so that barrier definitely decreased. And I find myself also just when I meet new people or I link, link with them on LinkedIn just to a more spontaneous uh, invitations, you know, from both sides to just jump, jump on a video call at least for 10 minutes or something just to, uh, to say hi and to uh, get acquainted. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I do that a lot more these days, and that is definitely a good thing. Uh, I like that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look at us, Dion. We haven't spoken for years, and now we're on a, now we're in a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so a it's, lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You'll have to uh, you'll have to do a, a, a real meeting in Lisbon uh, someday. <laughs> yes, that would be great. And uh, with some, I heard the Portuguese wine is very good, so uh, we'd be happy to try that. The, the yeah. Portuguese like to think so, and uh, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> I already thought so. So uh, just to go on a more personal note, you have a family as well, right? You have a couple of kids running around in Lisbon. Correct. Two of them are running already. Two of them are crawling. Okay. Uh, so um, yeah, we when we moved here, we uh, uh, our oldest daughter is now seven, so she was four, and then the uh, the second daughter is uh, is four now, so she was one, and then we have two uh, twin boys that were born. Uh, one week before the, sh the lockdown here in Portugal. So it's been, a, it's wow. been an interesting year with uh, um, uh, twin babies born uh, amidst the full lockdown here in Portugal. But uh, we survived that. So I think the <laughs> all in all, yeah. we Yeah, that's uh, wow. That what a, what a yeah what a time to uh, to get twins even not not just one but twins. So uh, uh, and how is the COVID situation in Portugal now? Is it very is it very restricted still, or are things opening up? Um, the schools opened two weeks ago, so that's uh, that they were closed for more than two months. Uh, other than that, everything we're not we're not allowed to go to the office. Um, uh, and if if the numbers stay as they are, as of uh, April fifth, we are allowed to uh, go to terraces of restaurants and play sports in groups of four. So that is okay. uh, that's the first um, loosening of the of the lockdown. Yeah, uh, um, and then if that all goes well, then per mid April, then uh, it should be relaxed a little bit more. Uh, it, I think it, 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 the weather I think plays a role, so it's starting to be better weather here. And uh, yes, ho hopefully this was our uh, our last lockdown. I hope so. Oh yes, no, it's definitely a seasonal virus. Uh, I mean, even in the Netherlands, of course, we've experienced that last year. So let's hope that some more humi humidity and higher temperatures will. Uh, Will speed things up a little bit, but it's still very restricted. I must say, it's uh, it's it's about the same as here. But you are not allowed to go to the office at all. Um, no, you need a you need a signed paper from the owner of the company to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, that I can facilitate, of course, but um, yes, um, but you're not really supposed to. So I go, you know, once or twice a week to check the mail, and uh, and, yeah. and that's it. Um, yeah. Which is a which is a pity, as we discussed. I mean, uh, I, I like it. We have a nice, creative team, fun people. Besides what they do, also, so it's nice to connect with them. Uh, normally, I would be going to the Netherlands, uh, you know, on a more regular basis to meet with uh, the team there, which is now also yeah. fully uh, uh, online. So it's um, yeah, it's a pity. It's a pity that you can't uh, uh, have the foster the relationships that you normally have with inside, inside your company in a way that you normally do. I mean, yeah. uh, practically things work, you know, yes. so we, 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 we do our projects and uh, they go fine. 
so in that sense, it can be done, but uh, I think it could be better and also definitely more fun if we would see each other. Definitely, yeah. There's also an element of fun that is that is sort of missing, uh, that's out of the equation right now, which is simply just the random human interactions that we all that we all love, and you know you can transmit energy and receive it from your from your workforce and your your colleagues. Yeah, uh, luckily we are uh, uh, you know a we have a pretty small core team, so it's easy for us to facilitate. But the three W, sorry. The three D W D workforce. It is a tongue twister on purpose. So it's it's much easier in Dutch. You you haven't thought you haven't thought this through uh, when you started the deal. No, I, 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 I look at all the fancy agency names and they are all tongue twisters, so it's fine. Okay, Tugendbrechers, as they say in German, right? But three D V D in Dutch is pretty is is much easier, but. Uh, yeah. No. So, how is the three D W D workforce divided now? Because you still have staff in the Netherlands. Um, yes. How how is that how is that divided in, in numbers? Uh, we're roughly uh, twenty twenty five people in the Netherlands and ten in Portugal. Okay. And, and, then we and have, that's. Uh, and then we have uh, partners uh, around the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. And uh, but I think the number in Portugal is steadily increasing, right? Yes. Yes. It is. It is. Yeah. And we plan. Uh, we, we plan to grow here. Uh, yes, exactly. But we, will, but we will always keep our Dutch base. I mean, that's uh, yeah. that's important to us. That's also the, the the soul of the of the company. That's where it started. Yes. And uh, so we, we will never abandon our Dutch uh, uh, team. But we we do plan to grow here because growth will be related to new international markets and those we plan to um, service from here. What do you see as the you know the fastest emerging market when it comes to what you are the services that you are providing which markets are most interesting right well now? if i if i look at malls so where mm -hmm. are malls being built um that is um, um asia mm -hmm. and uh, there's already been a huge wave of development there but uh, it's not uh, slowing down uh and then recently within asia i think india is a uh, oh yeah very uh, very big very important um, Africa uh, which is uh, a very interesting market for us we'd, uh, we'd like to do more than we're doing currently it's uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a bit more complicated because it's not as um, not as straightforward in terms of ownership and clients uh, than it is in Europe or uh, South America or North America for that matter uh, but it's very interesting, and I, I, I would love to do things there just because of the, you know, it's completely different, and there, there seems New to cultures. be cultures, cultures, and there seems to be, you know, the, I think there's a misconception also in Europe about, you know, Africa. People think of uh, that it's uh, not doing so well, and of course, for some areas that's the case. But there are really countries that are uh, in a really upward spiral. Um, and uh, it's nice to see. It's nice to see that uh, it's going in the right direction, and they're building nice things. I actually already saw that uh, where we s started doing work in Mexico. That if you compare what is being built there to what we have in Europe, they have the advantage that they were starting to build things later. So their yes. malls are brand new and amazing, and we have tw a lot of them 20, 30 year old malls, which are, of course are uh, slightly less amazing because they're older. And uh, so it's yes. the advantage of starting later. You can right away infuse all the latest. Yeah, it's what they call, uh, yeah, it's what they call leapfrogging, right? Yes. So uh, I, the, uh, the example I sometimes use, for example, for Africa is that they skipped the PC. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so to speak, they, they, they are very mobile savvy uh, because that's where most of, of uh, lots of those countries or areas started really. Yeah, I think uh, South Africa was leading on uh, mobile banking technology. Uh, yeah, no surprise there. No surprise there. So how about China, Dion? Is that, is that an interesting market for you? Have you been working there or is that still something to conquer? Well, no. We have done some small projects in China. Uh, potentially, it's a very interesting market, of course, because it's uh, one of the leading countries in the world now and it uh, has an immense uh, mole development pipeline. Uh, it's not as easy for us uh, with uh, language and also um, uh, competitiveness in the in, in the local market. Um, so um, we, the projects we work on are usually more high end. Uh, 
Uh, whereas in, in the rest of the world, we can also do, you know, like a, a local shopping center. So it's, yeah. uh, that, that, but there's a lot of high end projects. So potentially we could do more in China and I would like to, um, but um, um, uh, not as much uh, as we would have liked at this moment. Okay. Well, that's still a, a world to win in that regard. Yes, yes. There's plenty of said, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, th true. Okay, so uh, we will definitely link uh, stuff that we talked about in the description. Um, uh, also some, some, some new projects of yours. But I'm curious to know uh, what are the exciting, exciting things you uh, have been working on in terms of which brands are you, are you uh, uh, trying to activate right now or which, are, uh, which brands are a perfect example, in your opinion, of you know, playing that game right, the combination of offline activation and the online journey? Ooh, good question. Well, yeah. the, 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 the forefront brands that we're uh, working on uh, now, uh, I cannot say. Uh, because uh, fair enough, they are under uh, NDA. Uh, we know how that works, which is a pity. Uh, the, the 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 nice online offline connection. Um, there are there are multiple. I think you see a lot of uh, uh, brands that started online and then went offline. So um, uh, Warby Parker, uh, Bonobos. Uh, this is both U.S. Uh, I think they are uh, uh, good examples of that. Um, there are some uh, new brands uh, coming in um, that are uh, very much on the experience because of that reason, because they started online where you can't do that that much uh, and then they go offline uh, and, and they go full scale. And also because they're not tied to the traditional thinking of having to build a store uh, but they're there to build uh, something cool to enhance their online. So yes. that has a huge impact on your thinking and on what you're building. Yeah, uh, completely different approach. Very different approach because you don't need to tick the same boxes. Well, you do, but that's you start in a different order. Yes. Um, so um, I think those two I, I would mention now. There are more. I mean, you get uh, All Birds is uh, is doing it well. Um, uh, Casper. Uh, although I'm not sure about, um, I can only comment on it from a, a customer experience point of view. I don't know how it's doing financially, but uh, I think there are, uh, there are a lot of nice initiatives. And um, uh, but a, a lot of times, and that's also a thing. A lot of times, what they do now is go in through pop-up stores, and uh, a pop-up store, um, if you do it properly, is still a considerable investment. It's because uh, you're building a store. And it's temporary, mm -hmm. so it's actually not per se cheaper. But traditionally, in um, I think in the Netherlands, the idea was a pop up is like a, you know, more low budget version of a store, which is not true. And uh, I think by allowing um, through the forefront concept to have brands do so, talk about all the experience, deliver the experience, but not building out a full full fledged store, um, has the advantage that more brands can tap into it. Because uh, yeah. they might not be able to do uh, eighty thousand on a store, on a pop up, but they might be able to do uh, you know fifteen, and that allows uh, a whole different uh, group of uh, brands that do well online to 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 focus more on their offline experience. Yeah, the lower barrier of entrance. It makes it uh, yeah m makes it much more accessible for uh, not even only the high end brands. So not. No, no, it doesn't need to be high end. No, yeah. no. I mean, I could also imagine that certain brands have a very seasonal or a very local, uh, you know, objectives that they can pretty easily, uh, uh, you know, target this way. Yes. And uh, yeah. Now, if you think about it, it's a really broad spectrum of possibilities and uh, applications. Uh, we will uh, certainly link some uh, some examples. And uh, maybe it's a cool idea that when you are able to talk about those uh, those brands that are now working with the storefront concept, that uh, that you come back in the podcast and uh, yes. we can uh, we can analyze them. Sure. No, I yeah. will definitely. Uh, I'm open to that. Uh, uh, probably uh, in Q3 this year. That's when uh, we'll have something to uh, to show and uh, and also have analyzed uh, the, the results of it. And exactly. That's very interesting to to know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Dion. Last last question. Uh, 
when you look, f let's look, uh, have a look into the future when it comes to retail and all the things we, we talked about. Uh, I'm not going to hold you, uh, hold you to it, of course. It's a prediction. But uh, when you put on your futurist hat, uh, what is the wildest thing we would see in about 10 or 20 years when it comes to these uh, well, hybrid, offline, online, virtual experiences? What is the wildest thing you ever thought of uh, when you see a storefront uh, that could be possible? Well, there's different ways of looking at that. I think uh, creatively, you already see crazy things happening. And that will, maybe there will be more 3D printed versions of that, which allows you to go crazier uh, in that. And uh, so that is one thing. I think the biggest impact will be that uh, the model of the mall or the retail will change. And especially organized retail. So with organized retail, I, I mean, not a high street where you have not many different owners, where it's hard to collectively do something differently. But if you have a mall, um, I think the old model will change of, you know, signing a deal for rent for a long period of time and then renew it or not. Uh, I think it will go towards a, role, a, a stronger role for landlords to enable brands to do things smart and efficiently uh, offline. Um, uh, like they are used to online. So think about, you know, uh, all the services Amazon offers to online e-commerce brands that a landlord is expected to do that uh, for, for a brand. Uh, yeah. Less stock, more help with uh, logistics, more help on flexibility in the way storefronts look. Um, all those things, I think that's where it's headed. I think, uh, and, and quickly. Do you think that we will uh, at some point, uh, you know, get to a stage where a mall is being built with that approach in mind? I mean, now it's mostly... It is uh, already happening. It is already it, happening. It, wow. Okay. Yeah, it, it becomes sort of, I mean, the, the whole plan behind it, the whole philosophy behind it will, will be very different. I mean, now it's, uh, I mean, it, it is already happening, but most of the malls are legacy malls right now. Yes. Uh, based on the old model of actual shopping. Uh, but I, I could imagine that a mall is being built with the philosophy of basically being a brand theme park or something like that. that, that this is happening. This is happening in the Middle East. Oh, wow. Uh, this is happening in, uh, in the UK. I think uh, there, are, uh, there are many people looking at this. And, uh, and here's also the, 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 the interesting thing. Uh, because if you're wanting to do that, you need to tap into a whole new group of brands that allow you to keep that mix, mix interesting and therefore you need different models than just a store and uh, a kiosk and a pop-up because it needs to fit to the brand and it needs to be feasible both technically and economically yeah. um, but if that's figured out then i think it's interesting for all it's just that it's difficult of course in existing properties to change to that because that's not how the property has been evaluated and financed um, uh, so you cannot just, you know, it's not like a uh, Jenga where you just pull out a piece and then hope that it keeps standing. It won't. So it's easier to do that uh, right away and uh, completely from scratch in that direction. Very interesting. Lots of things to, th to, to think about and to imagine of what, what will be possible in the future. Again, we will link uh, some of your projects, some of the 3DW projects. Three, sorry. Damn, this is not easy. 3D WD projects. It happens the, uh, within the company the also still, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, <laughs> that's a, that's a relief. Uh, we will also link the, the the video of the project that uh, we collaborated on in uh, 2016 in uh, Twas and Mills, Vancouver, which is basically a pre. Uh, how do you say that? So, yeah, kind of a pre-stage uh, interactive shopping experiences with v I remember even re that we recorded a uh, sort of a hostess there a virtual hostess that would help you find your way uh, yeah, and I, that's I funny, that one that one we um, that was a pre-recorded concept uh, yes and uh, since then we've developed technology that uh, allows you to speak to a real live person and that right, calling in live basically Yes, we call it ah. Scotty, like beam me up Scotty uh, concept. And basically what it does is uh, you have people sitting in one central location and they take calls from several places throughout the portfolio. 
uh, and then you can call and they can see where they're calling from and then they can talk to them, give them, share their screen, give information. So it's taking that pre-recorded version to an, a different level. And of course, this technology also uh, is going to be employed in our forefront concept because you could use that to advise on a product uh, or yeah. still on a product. Interesting, very interesting. They, so they always have to look sharp whenever someone beams them up. Yes. They, they, they always have to be camera ready. To look camera ready. <laughs> Well, you, your shirt look nice, looks nice, Dion. So you're, uh, you're, 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 you're more than camera ready. Thank uh, you. Yeah, and I, w one thing I, uh, uh, I also uh, found very cool when it comes to activation is uh, the chef, the chef that, rec that, that recorded uh, cooking tutorials for, tutorials for a brand of, uh, you know, food boxes, basically. Yes. Uh, and I, if I remember correctly, there was also sort of a touch screen where they could, but it, it's a bit more of a primitive, uh, way, way of doing that, right? Where they could uh, leave their, their email address of their, uh, their uh, yeah, contact info yeah, and then would receive. They, yeah, they could, uh, they could leave their email address. So you'd have a chef on a big screen and uh, you could interact with the chef and pick which meal he would prepare for you. And then uh, yeah. you could leave your email address and then you could get a link to order uh, the um, right. package. So that was yeah. uh, the simpler version, which now, of course, you can also take make more elaborate the reason though uh, even then we could do it more uh engaging uh but the reason we didn't is that what well, we always have to bear in mind when we do an activation in a, in a in a in a high traffic location is that people are not there for whatever it is that we think of so even though we think it's very important that we have a virtual chef concept there most people are there to go to h&m or to go to yes. uh, something else so any second we steal from them is one. So if we go too complex in terms of the engagement we're seeking, we're going to lose them. So yes. we're designing these activations in a way that it's a minimum uh, intrusion. Uh, and then once we have a connection and people have left their information behind, then we have the opportunity to connect with them again and you know, uh, maybe when they're sitting at home, they go back through it and then they complete whatever it is we would like them to complete. Um, yes. Short that, bursts of yeah. added value. Correct. When when they are passing by, it's a very it's a, how do you say that? Yeah, it's very intricate. It's a, uh, you have to choose your moment and you have to choose your action very very specifically, and also probably base it on on data uh, to yes. get it as it's right really as possible. Easy. We use data, but we also use the check, would I do it and would my mom do it? That's always the best. The boerenverstand, we call it in the Netherlands. Yes, exactly. Like, would I walk by an activation and leave it, yeah. fill in 20 lines on a form on my mobile device? No, I wouldn't. Ne never. Uh, so uh, we go for the minimum, and we use that minimum to later build the relationship up through different mobile or uh, yeah. other types of communications with them. Where the forefront is different from the 3D WD activations that we discussed is that because we're making it more of an enclosed area, it feels more like a shop. So it's also more intimate. So it's not a hoarding. It's a it's an intimate space where people, by stepping in, they show more commitment. So it, it feels different, and you we feel we can ask for more uh, yes. because we're giving more. Also, you're giving more. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting stuff. I look forward to seeing uh, the fruits of that um, and uh, keep an eye on it. It was very, very good to talk to you again, Dion. It's been too long. And, uh, Likewise, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> Thanks, uh, you're welcome. And uh, happy that uh, the company is doing well and that exciting things are on the horizon. Um, so uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for being here in this podcast. Thanks, Ian. And uh, hopefully speak to you soon. And good luck in, in uh, Lisbon. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy the wine. Uh, today it's a bit uh, drowsy, but uh, I will uh, I will definitely uh, enjoy the sun. <laughs> okay, very good. Happy to hear that, Dion. Thank you again, and uh, speak soon. Speak soon, Ian. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thanks.